Chasing the Cover is a bi-monthly podcast where friends and library co-workers, Mary and Jen, review books, study the publishing industry, and try to unlock the secrets behind every cover. Can you judge a book by its cover? Join Mary and Jen on the case to find out. Hello, welcome to another episode of Casing the Cover, the book podcast where things are about to get real. My name is Mary, with me as always from a distance is my co-host Jen. Hi, Jen. Hello. I am going to talk about some very important things with this month's book or this episode's book. Mm -hmm. And I am going to feel like we are making very important and poignant and I don't know, valuable commentary. Which probably means this episode won't be funny. <laughs> I'm, I don't know, probably not. It, well, it might be, there might be some funny stuff, but I, the book itself was not really funny. And we had funny parts in it. It was very human. Is this the last of your backlog or do you still have a couple? I have a couple in the backlog, but they're not super important. And okay. at first, I didn't think that we would talk about this one. But after looking at the different cover art, so I will be talking about the different cover art, mm -hmm. but also really thinking about, like, we haven't done a whole lot of nonfiction. No, the last time we did nonfiction was actually like a year ago, over a year ago, because I attempted to do, um, I can't remember the name of the book. It was like a, kind of more like a self-help, inspirational kind of a book. And I didn't finish it because it was like, it was supposed to be kind of inspirational self-help, but then all of it was like these weird, like, antidotes from this woman's life. And like, oh, you should go out and look at a flower. Because one time my daughter looked at a flower and it was fun. It was that kind of a thing. Oh my goodness. Where it was like, here's my life experience and here's the exercise you should do now because of my mm -hmm. little short story. So I think that was, the, you haven't done nonfiction yet for the pod, have you? I, I don't think so. And I read a lot of nonfiction. You do. We just don't tend to talk about it. Well, because usually nonfiction's not that interesting. The covers are usually pretty boring. They're pretty straightforward. Yeah. Especially the nonfiction that I read. It's like, yeah, very straightforward. We are talking today about The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Okay. And with a title like that, if you didn't know it was nonfiction, if you didn't know anything about it, it's sci-fi, it's fantasy, it's... Yeah, kind of. It kind of rings kind of like um, The Life of Pi, or which I don't think is technically a fantasy. I haven't seen it. Um, yeah, like or Pi is Benjamin more kind mental. of Benjamin Button it kind of sounds like that kind of like a like a not like straight up fantasy sci-fi but those kind of fantasy sci-fis where it's like normal people with a slightly interesting like weird phenomena kind of a thing so here's the cool thing it kind of is it kind of is that but it's also a memoir but it's also real okay it's, okay so the story is about Henrietta Lacks, mm -hmm. also known as Hila. You know what Hila is? No. Okay, I'm going to enlighten you all what Hila is. Okay. So Hila is these cells that apparently all of science uses. Like everybody in science, everybody in medicine uses the Hila. Okay. And they were taken from Henrietta. This is the sad part. They were taken from Henrietta without her consent when she was going for, um, she was a patient, a, a cancer patient. So she's going for therapies and things like that. And they scraped off some of these cells. And then the cells started multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, and multiplying, and multiplying, and they don't die. Is that an unusual thing to happen? Yes. This is like the only set of cells that this apparently has ever happened to. Weird. So you see what I mean? Like this is like sci-fi. But it's a thing stuff. that actually happened. But it's real. That's creepy. Yeah, right? It, oh, and it gets creepier. So I don't want to get too super dark because we are not a very 
political poignant podcasty type thing. We are pretty lighthearted and I want to keep us pretty lighthearted. But the cells were taken without her consent. This was back, back in like the 1950s. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go back to my notes on this. We might have, we might touch on this on our year end wrap up, but I don't think we, t- this sounds kind of familiar now. now. Okay. Now you're talking about it. But I really want to talk about. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, but I'm like, oh okay, I'm slightly familiar with what we're talking about now. Yes. So, um, yes, she died in 1951. And just, it was, you know, a lot, I'm sure people are probably a little more familiar with like the Tuskegee experiment and things Mm -hmm. like that, which is basically, it's an abuse of people of color. Like let's not mince words at all about what happened to Henrietta what happened in Tuskegee experiments, what happens in med- medicine, kind of a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, consent is one of those things that they're like, oh, I suppose we can get your consent, but do we really need to? It's probably, you know, a thing too. I mean, medical privacy and things like that, I'm sure that's only been a concern like the last couple of decades. I doubt in the 50s, there was a big concern over you know, getting sued because you let out patient information or misused patient stuff or whatever. I'm sure that also didn't exist. Yeah. So, and this is all surrounding John Hopkins. Mm. So this is not like some little lab somewhere that was like, oh, we got a hold of something and we need to do this. This is a major medical institute that's pulling this crap. So the three different covers, obviously one of them has Oprah on it because it's the HBO movie cover. Mm -hmm. And then there's two covers, which I'm again, back to assuming we've got one that's for the print and one that is for um, ebook. Right. The ebook one is like screams 1950s. The font is very 1950s. It's kind of the like stretched letters, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. When we post the pictures of it, you'll see what I mean. The letters are, it kind of looks like a Pink Panther movie. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, and it's the profile of Henrietta with some very 1950s-esque vehicles and people walking around in the background. And it's very bold colors. Not as bold a color as the print book which is bright pink and orange Mm -hmm. with um a black and white picture of Henrietta kind of off in the corner both of the pictures are technically of Henrietta because the black and white photo is her and the bright orange pink splotchy one is herself oh that's really cool right so I, I just think that this is like a really neat cover because it's sort of like, here's the picture of the person, but also here's the picture that's kind of the weird sci-fi aspect of this, but it's also real. Again, I keep going back to, this is very weird, but also real. And from far away, it doesn't look like, it's, it's not like you're looking at like the picture of the brain or something from like far away, cause I'm looking at it right now. It just looks like a orange and pink polka dot kind of a print. Right, which could also be very 50s. Right, exactly. And I love that part as well. And, but you can tell if you zoom in on it that there it's, it sells. Right, and it's, as like, the closer you get, the more detailed that image gets. Yes. And the black and white picture is also kind of sad, kind of poignant, kind of, I don't know. It's the only real picture that like exists of her. I guess there's a couple of pictures that they think are of her, but this is the picture that they're like, we know that this is Henrietta. We know that this is her. Um, We know when it was taken, where it was taken. All of this stuff is talked about in the book. She looks nothing like Oprah Winfrey. And she doesn't look anything like Oprah Winfrey. She's a very beautiful person, mm-hmm. um, but she doesn't look anything like Oprah. Um, so 
Rebecca Skloot is the author and the book is written almost first person okay. from Rebecca's point of view, which is also really weird. And I have mixed feelings about that as well. The book starts with Rebecca Skloot talking about why she wanted to do this research project mm -hmm. on what is Gila. And so it all stems from this female journalist in our, basically our modern times, sitting in a chemistry class and hearing about Gila. And then that was it. And like, well, where did these cells come from? Who was Henrietta? Why did, and all these different questions that she had, which I think like all of us who have any kind of curiosity in the world have been there. Right. Where we're like, okay, but why don't you tell me more about this? Why, why, I want to know. Mm -hmm. But, <clears throat> and this is just my spin on it. So feel free to take it as it is. Rebecca Skloot is a young white woman. Mm -hmm. And it's, so she's telling this, the story of this black woman whose life was pretty much like obliterated from history. And now she's not like telling the story from her perspective. She's telling it from the perspective of her doing a research project. Right. It's, it's recontextualizing a black woman's story through the eyes of a white woman in college. Right. And I'm like, I know that's not what was intended. But it's a, it's an ongoing problem in media. There's a, I think it's a Be Kind Rewind video kind of talking about the help specifically. Have you ever seen the help? No. Um, and how, well, how that movie is framed as, you know, the nice white person telling the story of the black people that can't mm -hmm. tell it themselves. And kind of that's an ongoing issue in media in general, especially like the kind of white savior trope. And there's, there is a lot in this with like film theory and media theory and stuff too, that, that deals with that. So you're, you're not wrong. It's, it's definitely that it's definitely that. Yeah. I, I just, it, it kind of gave me pause. That is not to say that this isn't a beautifully written story and she does go talk to the family and she gives voice to the family very much in the way that she heard it from them. She right. doesn't like fix the things that they say. She doesn't put words in their mouth. At least I don't think so. It was presented that way. <laughs> But she also could have just told it from their point of view and didn't have to be from her point of view. Yes. So from one perspective, I understand why she did it this way because she was really kind of telling the story about how difficult it was to find this information. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to be desired. I started reading the one about the Golden State Killer. What is the name of that book? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't... I cannot yeah, remember the title of the book now, but it's kind of one of those where it's similarly written from the point of view of the author. And she's kind of been tied a lot to the case because while she was writing this book, she died and she's married to a comedian and he kind of helped finish the book. And it wasn't until after she died that the case was kind of reopened because there was this new interest in the case and they actually ended up catching the guy. So she's kind of tied to it and that she's this kind of investigative journalist slash writer. But it's kind of weird to read about a bunch of murders and have half of the book from like, here's what happened to this person. They're br br brutally murdered to then go. And I'm sitting in my daughter's bedroom writing about this. And my husband has to go to an event tomorrow. It's that weird, like, we're telling the story about these people who this bad thing happened to and then you're breaking that tension of telling their story with okay now let's talk about my arbitrary life yeah it's kind of unsettling there were some weird moments in this this book is also not written chronologically mm, i feel like that happens with a lot of memoirs too especially when they're not about um, you when they're about somebody else yeah and so it's written chronologically by the way that Rebecca Skloot found the information. Mm -hmm. So it's chronological from her point of view, once again, but not necessarily from the family's point of view, not necessarily from 
obviously Henrietta's point of view. Granted, there is so little known about Henrietta Lacks that you couldn't necessarily tell the story with justice. You couldn't tell the story from her perspective, from her mouth. Right. But you could also have your narrator be nameless and not try to make it about you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's another big one. Um, I did learn a lot about this, about the science of cell research and things like that. That is not to say that this book is super dry and boring. Mm. So one of the things that I think people are turned off by nonfiction reading is that they're going to fall asleep reading it. Yeah. They're going to be bored. They're, they're going to feel like they're in school. This is not that. I, I definitely learned a lot of stuff about social commentary with this. I learned a lot about um, the lifestyles of people. I learned a lot about the scientific side of it. And again, kind of the, gee, that's nice, but also, no, it's not. The author's narrative about the doctors and their choices that they made doesn't make them seem like villains. Oh, it's it, too forgiving. It's very forgiving. Now, I won't say it's too forgiving, but it's probably too, too forgiving coming from a little white girl telling the story. Which again, this isn't from this woman's family. It isn't her story. It's it's easier to be objective and go, well, yeah, they did a bad thing, but it was for the greater good when it's not your family member that they stole this this from, right? Right. And so throughout the book, though, um, the author does talk about how she kind of has a friendship uh, that blossoms between the youngest daughter of Henrietta Lacks mm -hmm. and herself, which also, like, by the end of the book, I, I don't want to give stuff away. Let's just say voices are not heard the same way. <laughs> And I don't know, I don't want to downplay a book that is really full of great information, stuff I never would have learned about, people I never would have learned about. But also, yeah, I it wasn't the best way the story could be told. Right. And also, I don't know, I guess it's, I kind of wonder about people's motives. Can you imagine if it were written instead from the daughter's point of view? And, and that's just it. Like, it is mentioned multiple times in the book that the family of Henrietta Lacks is, like, split on this whole thing. Some of them feel like they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to know anything about it. They want it to never have happened. And then, like, this daughter and a couple other people are like, no, we want to fight for this. And we want to talk about her story. And we want to tell people about it. So, again, though, it's like the white author came in and rescued them and told the story because clearly the daughter didn't have the skill set to tell this story. Right. That's and it just up. got very cringy. I'm like, you could have just ghostwritten this for the daughter. Right. And it, or it could have been, you know, it could have even been, Hey, I was interested in this. I collaborated. I found her. This is her story. You could have, right. that could have been told in a foreword going, hi, this is me. I'm the author. I found out about this in a class and it interested me. So I went looking for more and I found the family. So I'm going to tell this from their point of view and intersperse it with the history of it. It could have yes. been done that way. And she still could have taken her author credit and still told her little story and then made the rest of it about the family and about the daughter and about what happened to this woman and about her life from the point of view of her family and interspersed with learning this information from other sources, right? And I'm not going to say that it didn't lean heavily on that. There was heavy, heavy talk of the family. There was heavy talk of this, of Henrietta's um, youth and her upbringing. And really right up until she died, there was a lot of storytelling. And I do think that a lot of that storytelling came from stories that um, 
the author was told from the family members. So yes, it's very heavy. It wouldn't have been much to take out of the book to just take out her part. Right. Like that's, that's my energy on it. She didn't need to make it about her. Right. At all. It was been easy just to take herself out of the picture. Um, there's only a couple of times and really even that could have been spun the if the dialogue was flipped it wasn't I was talking to the daughter it's I as the daughter was talking to the author about this Mm -hmm. like you could have just flipped the script and gotten into the daughter's head instead of the author's head I, I don't know but those those were my my only negative about this really because they so much more went into this about like what it was to be a person of color in the 50s and and really even in like the 20s and 30s uh, because it talks about her childhood and what it was like and it talks about you know what happened to her and all the children that she had and why she had the children and why she made these life choices and all of these kinds of things. And it does that very well, I think. And it's definitely a life I never would have like experienced myself. Like mm-hmm. I would, I don't know. As one, it's a young person in the 1920s living on a tobacco plantation, um, which became their tobacco plantation. So the family owned it and things like that. They took it over and things. So there's a lot of good pieces to this, but then there's also like from the perspective of the doctors and you're getting this, well, we did it for the greater good. Right. We did this because um, it had value for the future. And now she has you know, her cells have outlived all of us or, and will outlive all of us. And yet it dehumanizes Henrietta. Well, and it points to the fact that, you know, when this happened, she was already being dehumanized because of her color. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's why, you know, you're saying it's, it's kind of, it's kind of squicky that they kind of let these doctors off with, well, we did it for the greater good. We mm-hmm. completely disrespected this woman's entire livelihood and, and have brought her down to what she can offer science because it's for the greater good. So it's okay to have ruined this woman's life and her family's life and done this without her consent because it's fine. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. I I feel like there is a lot she could have done. Biggest thing she could have done is removed herself from the story. She didn't need to be part of the story. Uh, But that's just my take on it. So I was a little interested um, I have this other cover that's the Oprah cover. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, I'm trying to look at the cast. Rose Byrne is um, the author. What's the author's name again? Uh, Rebecca Skloot. That's who she plays. She plays the author. Um, and from what I can see, I'm trying to find another reliable source to confirm this. But Oprah is playing... Deborah Lax, is that the daughter? Yeah, that's the daughter. So you put Oprah's face on a book that isn't even about her character. <laughs> oh, I thought it was, I thought Oprah was like Henrietta. No, Renee Ellis Goldsbury is is playing Henrietta Lax. I, I understand a- that she's not, she isn't Oprah. But she's not a nobody. Like she's got she she was in Hamilton. Like she's a big stage star. So the fact that they completely just like no, we're gonna market this like it's a movie about Oprah is kind of it's more it's more let's let's tell someone else's story. <laughs> let's take wow. credit for someone else's work here. It doesn't have a very good rating. I'd be interested to see if the movie is any kind of decent. IMBD rates at 6.3 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes is 69%. Um, it doesn't, Google reviews are like 87, which isn't awful, but it doesn't seem to have the greatest um, 
the greatest rating here. Yeah. But I yeah. would be curious to see that movie. It does kind of seem like the the movie does the job the book should have done, which is putting it in the context of the daughter. But a lot of people are saying it's not as good as the book because it doesn't tell it right. So that's that's well, reviews from whoever. Okay, so here's the thing. The daughter and the author, like I said, they kind of go on this odyssey together to discover more stuff. Mm -hmm. Once once the author is allowed to talk to the daughter, because now you've got this other level of the men in the family won't talk to anybody. And the daughter really wants to talk to somebody and they keep like shutting her down mm -hmm. and telling her no. And she's like, I want to tell my mom's story. I want to, I want to put the, I, the world needs to hear this. And they keep shutting her down. So again, it's, it's the story is so many layers of a woman of color being erased mm -hmm. and being told, no, your story doesn't deserve to be told. Like, it's just layer upon layer upon layer of that. And I don't even know if the author realizes that that is what she did. No, probably not. And let me ask you this. How old is the daughter in the context of the story? Um, so when her mother, when Henrietta dies, the daughter is only like a year or maybe two years old mm -hmm. back in 1950s. So from the modern day retelling of this story of, you know, talking about the history and the friendship that is blossoming, apparently blossoming between the author and Deborah, it, she would be in her 50s, 60s, okay. you know? So am I saying that right? I think that's right. Yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah, it sounds about right. Anyway, it, the book it comes out came out in two thousand ten. Okay. So, yeah, you know, so she's a she's an adult, she's a mature woman, mm. um, possibly the same age ish as Oprah. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that makes sense. That's valid. Uh, and you know, it talks about how like she's afraid to talk about this stuff and she doesn't want the information getting into the wrong hands but she really wants people to know about it mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to get screwed basically and yeah I don't I don't, I don't want to give away the end of the book because while this is nonfiction, and you could just as easily do the research and find out what happened to everybody it is also a story mm -hmm. and it is a well-written story and it is captivating. And I did feel like I was reading a story with a very heavy science-based sort of thing. Like this could have been a, I don't know, it could have been a, a conspiracy theory movie kind of thing, you know? Like, look what these doctors did, oh my goodness. There's also references to some science fiction stuff that I have read that I thought was kind of cool. <laughs> like they made reference to the chicken heart story. Oh God, I don't even want to know what that is. Oh my gosh. So ages and moons ago, there was this radio play program called Lights Out. And one of the episodes in Lights Out is about the chicken heart and the chicken heart grows and grows and grows till it like takes over the city it's pretty much the blob um and so they talk about cells and reproducing cells and what happens when the science goes mad and it's very frankenstein mm. um, and so they there's this conversation about, about science there's a conversation about uh consent there's a conversation about the weirdness of these hela cells and all of it is wrapped around sort of this family memoir of Henrietta. I don't know. It's crazy. The whole book is crazy. It's a lot going on. <laughs> There's a lot going on in this book and it's very good. And I think people should read it. And like, you know, it's very difficult to recommend nonfiction books to people because they're like, I don't, I, I don't want to school. No school. 
Yeah, a lot of people don't like nonfiction. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't dislike nonfiction. I just tend to prefer to watch documentaries to reading nonfiction. I think, I think I need both. Because like after reading this one, I went and watched a whole bunch of documentaries on um, Henrietta Lacks and mm-hmm. Hila Sells and some of the doctors that are mentioned. Uh, so like I went down the little rabbit hole of the Hila Sells. But also, I don't think I ever would have gone down that rabbit hole if it weren't for a compelling, interesting read like this book. Well, and I think it's right of you to acknowledge that it can be both a well-told story and also a little problematic. I think that some people tend to feel like if something is problematic, it is invalid. And I think that's a dangerous way to think about things things can both be important and problematic and knowing that they're problematic and noticing the the issues and learning how to fix the issues is kind of a better point than just pretending that everything that's problematic should just go in a corner and just pretend that problematic things don't happen. Well, and especially since like, if you just were to cast off this book because it's problematic, you're not going to read about Henrietta. Right. (laughs) Because there are so few books about this. So if, if you just say, well, I'm not going to read this book because it's problematic. Well, now you're throwing away the information. Right, exactly. So yeah, like, I don't know. I, I would not toss this book. I, I liked it. it but also, go in reading from the idea that this was written by a white woman in the modern day who is upper middle class and has no freaking clue about these people's lives right well and I think it's also then important to also acknowledge that there are other even though they're my, maybe not as mainstream that there are other resources about her now that you can also look to you just said you watched a bunch of documentaries and other things about her that well, maybe aren't as slanted to uh let me tell you about my story in the context yeah, of this woman's like, life the documentaries and things that I found were were clips they were little Right, but I'm just saying there are other resources where you can find out more about this woman that are actually about her. Yeah, but not as much as you'd think. Uh, maybe there should like, be more, and maybe that more shouldn't be an Oprah Winfrey movie. Yes, yes. Although one can hope that now that this has been an Oprah Winfrey movie, that, that will pave the way and open up some things and more people will talk about it. Apparently there is a big long documentary about Henrietta Lacks that was even more poorly done ages and moons ago and it's talked about in the book I can't find it so you know and really more of the research that I was looking at and the things I was reading were about Gila cells not about Henrietta so so I guess in that way, it does humanize something that in other contexts is only written about as kind of like your medical Marvel scientific discovery kind of a thing. Yeah. And it does rehumanize it and go, well, this isn't just, uh, you know, this isn't just a phenomenon that happened. And it's it, this is an actual human being that they use to get this. So in yeah. that context, it's important. But also, I think it's also fair to criticize, hey, maybe you shouldn't have made this about you. Yeah, that's my biggest complaint about the whole thing is like, don't make it about you. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my big, uh, that's my big nonfiction talk about things for the podcast. Who knows if I will ever talk about another nonfiction. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a good occasionally to bring up nonfiction. I think this is also a good one to talk about because, you know, in the context of what we try to do here, it is a very interesting cover. And it kind of also, we need to do an episode talking about movie movie covers, movie covers on books, because this is, again, this is, this is a weird one to me that the book cover isn't, doesn't even have the image of the actress playing the woman who the story is about. Right? Because Oprah I, isn't I mean, her. I mean, unless the movie leans heavily on like Deborah's story. Well, I think it does. And I, that might be, I think Oprah's also a producer. So that's probably her being a narcissist. But to continue to call this movie the immortal life of Henrietta when it's not about Henrietta anymore, 
is is a whole nother problem. Yeah, there's that's actually really funny. It wasn't something I expected. Um, oh, also the the book is kind of more the bright orange cover one. They're kind of a negative. The cover is more of a negative of what the HeLa cells look like when they're pictured, mm. because I think probably because the it would be too. It's very blue green instead of cells don't orange. naturally look like psychedelic wallpaper, Jen. Well, they kind of do, just like not that particular color scheme of psychedelic wallpaper. I don't know. Do you think anyway, they tried it with the original like images and they just didn't like the color scheme and they're like, crank up the contrast, boys? Yeah, well, there's a couple pictures that do kind of look more red orange, but if you look up Hela cells, they're they're more blue green. Mm. There's more blue in it, but there's a couple pictures that are that red orange, but it's there's so many different things about this that I'm like, okay, so they're not even really what the actual HeLa cells look like. They modified it to pretty it up for the cover. Well, yeah. They put Oprah on the cover and she's not Henrietta. There's a... It's just more distortion of this. It's, you know, and I guess that's what's kind of sad about it in general is maybe your author had good intentions trying to tell the story because it was like, hey, I learned about this interesting thing and I want to share that. But then it goes into all this to market this woman to sell a book, which is almost just as disingenuous as stealing all of her cells for medical science. Right? Like, because she also didn't consent to selling her story to Oprah. Right. And I'm like, and it, it was a struggle to get the daughter to consent to a lot of this stuff. Like, I don't know. I, I do think the consent was not coerced. No. But it was definitely like, it took some work. Right. Well, and also, it, obviously, it is the family now that has to give the permission because a dead woman can't give permission. Right. And I don't, I don't know. There's just so many, so many weird things about this book that I didn't anticipate. And the deeper we go, the more convoluted it seems to get. Well, I think that's kind of always a danger in general. So I kind of like biopics. I, I'm mm-hmm. into them. I, I like them. But there is kind of this weirdness with biopics because there's one of three things happening. Either you are, one, basing the story off of somebody who is living and has given their consent and maybe is involved in you producing their story. You're writing their memoir or they're writing their own memoir in some cases. Um, Or in the context of a biopic, you know, they're a consultant. They're helping you write the script. Um, Mm -hmm. A good example of this is Rocket Man. And apparently Rocket Man has a lot of stuff in it that didn't actually happen in Elton John's life, but he was a consultant and he wanted it to be presented the way that he wanted it presented because it's his life story and he was right. a producer on it. So he very much influenced it. And then you have the situation where it's a story about someone who's no longer living and the consent in the, the storytelling is coming from people who were around them in that time that's what we're reading here that's another good um example of that is the film bohemian rhapsody no they're not all going to be musical biopic examples <laughs> but like with bohemian rhapsody you know you're telling freddie Mercury's story when he's no longer here to tell his story and it's all based off of his friends and band members who are so full of themselves that you had to give their actors equal screen time in the movie that was actually a thing that happened in that movie Oh my gosh. Freddie Mercury could be the focus, but all the other band members had to have equal screen time. So their act, the people playing them had to have equal screen time. It, it was a monster for editing of that film. Wow. And then you have the third option, which is the weirdest one to me sometimes, is when you're talking about people who are real and actually exist and who are also still alive, and you're telling their story knowing full well that they can watch what you're trying to tell as their story. Um, the example of this would be The Crown, where, you know, the whole royal family's like, we're just not going to watch it because they put a lot of stuff in there that may or may not be true, may or may not be conjecture. And I, th- I think it's researched and it's based on, you know, a lot of these, these royalty documentaries get like the cousin of the queen to talk to them because she's the right. member of the royal family who will. But 
you you risk a lot making a movie and telling a story about somebody who's living and has nothing to do with the production of your story and you just yeah. gotta hope they're not gonna sue you kind of a thing <laughs> so i don't well, know i think it's weird biopics to me are are kind of they're interesting but they're that weird beast because someone is trying to tell some the documentaries do the same thing someone is trying yeah. to tell a narrative the way they want it told and things get put in or left out based on what message they're trying to get across. Yes. And you going back to the, you don't want to get sued part. This whole family has been like, they, they don't have the money to sue anybody. They don't have the wherewithal to sue anybody. And that was one of the biggest points made in the book is that this whole family has never made any money on this. They, it was her medical expenses were never paid for her funerary expenses were never paid for the family wasn't taken care of years later the family was used um their dna was tested without their consent like it's just layer upon layer of this family being abused by the medical system and the author still defended these these doctors that did this i I'm going to say, yeah, she defended them. Like, because she didn't call them villains and didn't out and out say, yeah, these guys were assholes to do this. She made them very human. And, you know, oh, oh, but it was a different time. Oh, but they did this in the name of the greater good. They did this in the name of science. Look at all the vaccines that came out of this and polio vaccines and all okay, of the cancer research. You can research. say it was a different time, but this family still has seen no gain from this. She right. still has descendants and she still has people in her, you know, she still has children who are alive in 2010 as of the writing of this book that no one has tried to compensate or make things right for. So that's kind right. of bullshit to say, oh, it's in another time. You need to realize the context, blah, 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 blue. Okay, well- that's no longer the case. And now there's a family that you could compensate mm-hmm. and no one still has. Right. right. And it's just, I don't know. Yeah. She, she makes nice for the doctors. I don't know. And, and this is going to get me in trouble. So feel free to cut it. If you feel like we're going to no, get I, in I trouble. I always cut the stuff might get you in trouble, Jen. But I think it says a lot about Oprah for marketing on this and it says a lot of what i believe about oprah you know oprah's not listening to this podcast she's not gonna yell at you no but like anybody who's a fan of oprah there are reasons i am not oh there's a lot of reasons to not be a fan of oprah but we don't need to get into that here yes i'm not gonna get into it but i'm just saying it's not a shock to me that oprah is the woman who chose to embrace this project right yeah. Well, and like, I don't know. I, I just think the, the the putting, I don't know who published the book with Oprah's face on it. The publisher probably did. And they probably went, Oprah's behind this. We'll publish it with her face on it. It'll sell more copies. But that's just such a weird thing to go. This is a, the, the mortal life of this person. Let's put someone else's face on the cover. And I mean, it's Oprah's face. You're selling it off of Oprah. But yes. Oprah's not playing Henrietta. Right. And I can't get I, over this. I, I hate to say it, but like you say that the, it was the publishing company. It's the publishing company that put her face on there. Oprah said yes. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously she bought the rights to make, I, mean, I don't know if she did, but a production company did. I just, I just feel like this is very Oprah. This is not shocking to me. Well, Oprah's just, a good businesswoman. I mean, she's like one of the richest women in the world. Um, but she's kind of done it on the backs of other people. And you know what? She's made some big mistakes on who she's put in her book club. Her book club picks, we could go into that. Oh, like what kind of book she's put in that? Yeah. Yeah. Because some of the books that she's picked and been like, oh, look how inspirational and wonderful and amazing this person is. And turns out that person is like a shit. <laughs> So let's let us not bag on Oprah too badly, <laughs> because I don't want to lose people because we're talking shit about Oprah. Um, you don't have to like Oprah, Jen. It's okay. 
All right. So should we then should we then say goodbye, the Jen? I I think we should say goodbye. Um, I will recommend another good nonfiction though. Okay. I recommend Sapiens. The only the only nonfiction I've read, even kind of somewhat recently enough to recommend it, is Orange is the New Black. Not the show, the the memoir, the book. Okay. Uh, which I might recommend last time I did nonfiction because it's the only nonfiction I've ever re- I've read in a very long time. Um, I might have recommended Sapiens too, but I yeah, don't know. um, just because it's it's an actual account of an actual person who was actually in prison. And again, there is the issue of her being a privileged white woman who was only in prison for like eight months. Um, but it is the point of view of this woman who goes to prison for a non or not nonviolent crime, um, and kind of experiences how awful prison is. Mm-hmm. And it's just a kind of a point of view into, and that's the thing is she doesn't, she does frame it of her own experience because it is her story going into prison. Um, but also sheds a lot of light on like the the abuse and shit that other people go through in the prison system. So it it is interesting in that context. So we'll have to talk about maybe that one and the how the series spins and spins. Oh, and spins the series is that. nowhere. Don't I I really liked Ernest New Black for a lot of it, but it mm-hmm. is nothing like the book. They kind of took just the idea of what happened to Piper? I think her real name is Kerman, can, something like that, right? P- Piper Kerman. Piper. Sure. It's not Chapman. Chapman's the character name, but in the show, it's not the same last name. But it takes what happened to her in her real life as kind of the premise for the show, and then fills in everything else with fiction. Um, have you have you read the book slash seen the show? I have seen the show. I've not read the book. Okay, because the. She never, you know, found her ex-girlfriend in prison. Like, the only time she ever saw her again was at, like, the deposition or whatever for something. They never, you know, got back together in prison. And she didn't have a prison wife. And the only other character in the show that's even vaguely based on someone that she actually knew in prison is is Red. Is she kind that that character's kind of based on the, the cook that mm. Piper knew in prison. But no one else in that show, everyone else in that show was made up. And that show did a lot of really good, interesting things and a lot of really bad, weird, stupid things. And the ending was atrocious. So. I never saw the ending. I gave up like a couple seasons in. And I was like, ah, I'm you done. You know, so they had, a, the first two seasons were really good. The third season was kind of weird. Fourth season, I think is the one that was like really, really stupid. Where like they kind of take over the prison. I think that was the fourth season. Yeah, like, I didn't see that one. Yeah, there's like a prison riot, and they like take over the the prison, and that's kind of where a lot of people turned on the show because the end of the previous season they killed off a really really um, big character, and then going the fourth season there was a consequence of that, and it was it got weird and like then they end up in Supermax and uh, just a lot of characters dropped off because they only brought like half the characters to Supermax and I was mad because like Red gets dementia and I was really pissed because she was like the only thing I cared about anymore on that show and yeah that's that's rough too yeah and everyone got a really shitty ending except for Piper who gets married to Alex and gets to leave prison early like (laughs) And the Piper, the Piper that wrote the book, Orange is the New Black, is a compelling woman who had a compelling experience. The character Piper Chapman is an asshole and I hate her. <laughs> Such a rant. Uh, and did A, should not have ended up with Alex, who is also an asshole and I hate her. And B, did not deserve a happy ending. And that's all I have to say about the show, The Orange is the New Black. Oh my gosh, we went, you went hard tangent. Oh, such a hard tangent. All right, I think it's time for us to go the gen. It is time to go, but this was a really good episode, and I I think it was a lot of fun. Should we say our goodbyes, Jen? We shall say our goodbyes, Mary. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much for cracking another case with Mary and Jen. To learn more about Casing the Cover, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Casing the Cover. To contact us or suggest a book, email casingthecoverpod at gmail.com. New episodes of Casing the Cover release the second and fourth Tuesday on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.